The winner bracket final, qualifier number one. Uh, guys, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't expect the Raiders against the Cats to be in the winner bracket final. It was funny because in the lobby when we joined, even the players were talking about it, and they took down some real powerhouses. So, big shout out to both of these teams to make it into the winner bracket final. Bit unexpected, but I'm very happy to see them here, and they absolutely deserve it, so yeah. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Now again, this is the first qualifier for Meta Madness. Heroes can only be played once within the series. We do not have any pre-bans for the first qualifier. But pre-bans, as usual, are tied to sub-goals on Twitch, as in all Meta Madness that we had before. And we can expect that for qualifier number 2, number 3, 4, and so on, that we will have pre-bans. Once that we are at that point, every single time we start a new qualifier, I will inform you how many pre-bans we have. I will inform you which pre-bans those are. They will be listed down here, so you can check that out. But for today, we don't have any pre-bans in the tournament. But every single hero can still only be played once within a match. Additionally, what you need to know is that we have $2,000 on the line. The whole event is fully financed by myself. And we have a double elimination system for every single qualifier. So there's a loser's bracket here. Whichever team loses now drops down into the loser's bracket. Teams accumulate points in all qualifiers by going as far as they can in the tournament. And those points get added up. You join a leaderboard and the top teams in the leaderboard at the end of all five qualifiers then uh, qualify for the playoffs. Fairly straightforward, fairly normal system. We've used similar ones in the past, and it's going to be great. The games that we had today, <laughs> honestly, they exceeded all expectations. I came into this with quite a few expectations because Meta Madness is always fun. But since we don't have any pre-bands yet, I was like, all right, it's going to be all right, but we'll see. And then today happened. One insane match after another one. Just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Now... In the winner bracket final, what are we going to get? Is it a 2-0? Is it a 2-1? Are we going to get some crazy picks or are things going to calm down a little bit right now? I mean, we'll see. We have Dehaka already uh, picked earlier. It's kind of funny too because both of the teams have some Spanish players. And when they were debating in the lobby and saying like, did you guys expect that we would be the two teams in the winner bracket final. Uh, some of them were like, of course, we believed in the in the Spanish boys. The Spaniards would carry this towards the uh, towards the, uh, the the winner bracket final. But yeah, or the grand final even. I mean, who knows? Now we got Hanzo for Nano. It was a bit of a battle, if you remember, in some of the previous games where Chromie they had to decide which team would pick Chromie away, who would pick Hanzo, two highly contested heroes, particularly in the series that the Raiders played against the team of Madara, Cure, and Legacy, since Madara has a bit of an overlapping uh, hero pool to some extent with Nano, and both of them are very strong in some of these preference picks, so they were trying to take him away from each other as well as guard them for themselves. Nagrom on Diablo, Rega. Good front line, and they got the global again. And, yep, we are looking at the last few bands here, but what is Johan gonna get? Typically, Jojo would, of course, be strong for him, and a hero that he plays a lot. But, yeah, we'll see. Grey main taken out. I mean, again, you already have Diablo and the Haka here, so you have a very beefy front line. If you have Greyman, you can take some of the camps out super quickly. You can also, of course, go for the boss. I can get quick kills against heroes like Hanzo and Brightwing. And we've seen that actually a couple of times now previously, where one hero was in trouble. Brightwing just teleports in, and then both of them get totally destroyed. So Genji gets banned. One Shimada is enough. You don't want to deal with two. It's not good for the gag reflex, you know? You see, like, both Shimadas at the same time. You're shit game and like yeah nobody wants that it's bad for the keyboard you know we gotta clean everything so uh, they're just banning one here out and it's like yeah, yeah one is enough but we get Garrosh Garrosh and Sylvanas okay Sylvanas and Hanzo for the damage Garrosh at the front can flip Diablo around a little bit and of course try and get his hands on Rhaegar but we haven't seen any damage yet taken by the cats and that moment is now. What's it going to be? Are we going to get a couple of mages? Is Liming going to make an appearance again? Are we just going to get... Uh, I mean, even Bala is technically an option, even though I would think that she gets picked later on one of the different maps. K 
Chromi and Falstad. So yeah, they still want to take Chromi for themselves here and make sure that Hanzo doesn't get both. Hanzo in one, uh, sorry, as Nano doesn't get both. Hanzo in one game and then Chromi in the next. So they have another global here too. And with that, Sven is our last pick for game number one in the best of three of our winner bracket final. I'm still super happy that these two teams are here. They really deserve it the way that they play today. But uh, yeah, it's Sonia. So Sonia's in. So we got our side lane as well. Cursed Tolo again. Map number one in this best of three. Without further ado, let's jump straight in. The Cats against the Raiders. The Cats against the Raiders. On the left, we have the Cats in blue with Captain Rex on Rega. Hereth on Dehaka. Unforgiven is playing Chromie. Drakia plays Falstad and Nagrom on Diablo. To the right side, their opponent here at the first qualifier with Sven on Sonia, Nan on Hanzo. We get Hunter Org on Brightwing, Johan on Garrosh. Exactly. And Gia is playing Sylvanas. All right, let's get this show on the road. Which team takes the lead? Which team is going to be able to win map number one? A lot of money picks over here. I already like it. Gia in particular, always riding in style into each battle. Got to really appreciate that. And they kind of juked them out a bit. Because everybody was expecting a Sivala's rotation to go on either the top or the bot lane. And instead they just ran into the middle. <laughs> so that's actually really, really funny. Everybody was guarding the side lanes because they expected Sylvanas to try and get the easy hit in. And then instead they just ran straight up into the middle, took one of the towers down. And that is pretty much the most that you can get out of that early game Sylvanas push. So nice little tweak by the Raiders right from the start. They impressed in their semi-final. Can they show a similar performance here? This is also going to tell us a little bit of what's going on because it's really difficult. Most of the teams reform to an extent, so you always have to ask yourself, how are the power levels right now? How much did they change? Now, of course, there's always a certain core of the teams that still stays the same, but some adjustments are being made and they have an impact. And we sometimes have a little bit of a tough time in the first qualifier at least to really judge which team uh, had has real problems which team made a mistake and which team just had a bad day or who stepped it up massively so yeah we'll see either way we now have of course the mercenary camps being focused on so they're starting to make their play for the siege giants in this case already on the blue team uh, we have also the mercenary camp on the left the bruisers claimed and seems like this might be a kill. No! Ah, ah that was a bit unfortunate. If with better coordination here on the drag from the Haka, they could have gotten that kill. Yeah, they didn't communicate that properly. Diablo flipping over immediately, the Haka aiming for the other side. If they just coordinate that slightly differently, I think they can uh, get the entire chain going and then take her out. But yeah, as is not as much as they were probably hoping for. But they were still able to force it back a little bit. Doesn't change the fact though that the Haga is now trying to get back and boy oh boy are they already losing uh, hit points topside. That's another tower gone and maybe more. Middle of the map also slight and small attack here. But this is a leading experience. This is structures taken on and I again have to stress how well the Raiders are playing this. This is impressive. Very impressive. So, uh, that is... Uh, yeah, honestly, I'm getting a little bit concerned here because I've seen the Raiders now perform in the uh, winner bracket semifinal and they did absolutely fantastic. The Cats, of course, with a great play against the Saboteurs, against Hazorps' team. I mean, that series was insane. In absolutely incredible. We've seen Choga, we've seen Murky. It was mind-blowing. But still, at the end, the Cats prevailed, and now that we're looking here at the Raiders, the question is still, can they just shut them down, or how is this going to play out? Because at least in the early game, they are the ones that make the plays. They have taken down a whole lot of structures already. Nothing crazy, no forts have fallen yet, but they've been able to take a couple of towers down and get these small early game leads that can very quickly add up to a lot more. So, yeah, there's that. I mean, either way, with this said, we now have a level 7 on the board. A bit earlier for the red team. Nothing too crazy, but they're continuing to interrupt any channel on the tribute to buy themselves a little bit more time. 
And yeah, the Haka in the middle, falls out at the top. That's of course a big advantage from the Drafts perspective what we're seeing for the Cats because right now we have, I mean, I was about to say we have two globals for them that they can really utilize here, but with Diablo dying, <laughs> that's them already shutting this down quickly. And Nano, he is escaping. They're even trying to turn it on uh, Rega, which hasn't quite happened. But there's a push going on in the middle of the map that forces even Forza to fly in and help out. So, yeah, this is tricky. But blue team, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating this a little bit because I'm just remembering what we had on the previous match. But essentially, when you're looking at it, it's bit on a tipping point, right? The blue team can still easily turn this around. All they need is a kill or two. But at the same time, this game has so far been going only one way. Not to a massive extent, but there's these small edges, these small advantages that the Raiders are now getting time and time again. And unless the blue team is able to now, you know, put their foot down and make a big play there, there is a real risk of this game getting out of control. And already it starts. I mean, Diablo dies again. They killed the Haka, so that's three kills to zero. And now this is really shifting. This is exactly what I was talking about. That is the big risk here, because this wall has been destroyed. The fort has taken damage. Mid lane, we're seeing the same picture. Down at the bottom of the map, they're now starting to push in with Sylvanas. And they are just, again, they're accelerating this. This is crazy. This is getting real nuts. And they're not overextending too hard here. I'm, they might still lose a hero, but look at this. They're turning on the Haka again, and that's a kill. They line this up so perfectly well, they get their heroic abilities at the perfect moment in time. It's instantly locked in by Nano, as you would expect from him. Again, the guy is amazing on that hero, and now they are able to take the first fort down. That doesn't even account for Sonya's at the top. That fort should fall in a second. This is just them crushing it. Four kills to zero, and they're not letting up. They're putting the opponent in a chokehold and just, yeah, choke the life out of them. That's what's essentially happening here. Second tribute is now up on the map too. And it's a bit of an oversight, I guess, to not take the fort out because now they still have a fountain here. So this could be even better than it already is. But, yeah. That is still nasty. I would not be surprised if someone would just move down and uh, take that fort out just to deny the fountain to them. But look at this, Nagrov, that ancestor did nothing for them. So yes, great, nicely done. Red team again with the advantages and another play for the Lord of Terror. <laughs> yeah, sure. Du mich auch. Lord of Terror my ass. That guy died three times already. And again, he's an absolute bully. I think the Raiders have just reached a completely different level now. It's crazy. They've always been good. So were the Cats. I mean, these two, these are two of the teams that have continuously been fighting for either being fourth or third place, which is definitely not bad. But now both of them have stepped it up a bit. And the question is for how long and how much they can really contest the top spaces here. But this is huge. This is really huge. There's a four that is destroyed. There's five kills to zero. They nearly have a level advantage. And bosses are now up on the map and they can be taken at any point. They're already starting with the siege giants at the bottom and now the mercenary camp over here. False that is already going down towards the bottom of the map can push the wave out, double check the boss and everything. But now there's a tribute that they gotta fight for. It's the third one. Yeah. Triple arrow is already in. I mean, in an ideal world, you follow up on it, but this was more of a safety thing, trying to ensure that nobody would fall. But they can now try and, of course, get that curse. And with experience just tickling in, level 13 is soon TM going to be there. So, yep, there it is. This is going to be a big battle that the cats have to win or they're going to eat the first curse. Now, thankfully for them, they are also the Harkar and Falstead pushing, but they're going up against an opponent who's about to hit level 13. And look at Sylvana, she's just moving to the top and saying like, ooh, free fort, nice, let's go. Diablo again attacked and barely saved, barely saved. And he's not out of the woods yet. He's deep in the woods, actually. He might die here and he is going to die. And so is Falstead. So guys, they're losing one, they're losing two. If they don't get counter kills here, then this is already... I mean, this is already a disaster. 
what is happening with the Raiders? The Raiders, they are taking no prisoners. There's the curse. Fort at the top is destroyed. Fort at the bottom is gone. Fort in the middle is about to get crushed. They killed Chromie. That leaves Rhaegar. And now they can just simply move for the keep. We are eight, nine minutes into the game and they're going to get this one. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And they might get more. They might get a second keep in the middle. Insanity. The Raiders, they're raiding. They're stealing everything. They're coming in and they're stealing the cats' food, their litter box, their lunch money, their girlfriends. I mean, whatever is there, they're, it's, it's theirs. They're taking it. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like, honestly, it's bonkers. Like, they are playing so well here. I mean, every single fight that they coordinate is just working like clockwork. And now you look at... There's not even a kill. <laughs> there's not even a kill for the cats. What is happening? Now, to be honest, I think they could have gotten more out of that curse. But I don't think they want to fight with level 13. So, they're playing this slow, they're playing this cool, calm, collect that they said, guys, we gotta keep and we gotta afford. Let's not risk too much. We'll take that, and then we play around it. So now they're going for uh, the boss at the top. They know they've been scouted. Falstead is coming. The Harker will move in soon. So he's coming too. They want to go for the fight. So they're all coming in here. They are, th this is a bit of a Hail Mary. Cats, where's the Gust? Where's the Gust? Arrow, not good enough. Not good enough. Garrosh down. First kill. This is the chance. This is the chance. Steal the boss now and win everything. Steal the boss and win everything. And they take it. They steal the boss and they kill Sonya. Finally. The cats are showing signs of life. Awesome. Really good stuff there. This was an important play. Now they can go for a double boss play and they can bring this back a bit. But that was important. If that fight is not taken by them, they are in real trouble. But this was a big opportunity. They took a risk and it paid off. Nicely done. So now they got a double. Up at the top, they're still trying to defend. And honestly, I didn't even expect them to do this. But yep, they are saving this one. Respect. Respect. Not too bad. They are able to save the fort. Who would have thought? Yeah. Nine kills to two. Sixteen, of course, is getting closer. And now they can try to defend at the bottom of the map as well. Obviously, there's a bit of momentum now going for the cats. But the question is still how much can they get with this? Right there, I don't think they can take that fort out unless they're really willing to push with it. They might be. But they're already getting some work done here. And now both teams, of course, have level 60 talents. Hanzo is at 46,000 damage, by the way. I mean, just look at the uh, blue team. They have 22,000 Chromie, which is their top number. So Hanzo is more than doubling that. All of the forts are still in, which is important because it means that continuous catapult pressure is still happening. Next tribute is coming up. Really good positioning also for the cats. And they still got to deal with the Harker. Yeah, as the game continues and the map opens up, these globals are, of course, pretty important. Map opens up further and further. You have globals and you can push these side lanes. So that's what we're seeing from them. And they're going to do the best that they can there. Uh, okay, so. And well, with that, we now have another push for the tribute. This one, they're going to let it go. Again, the position is just way too good. But how are they now going to transition from here? Their advantage is the structural lead. That's the big advantage. Now, of course, this also means that you have passive experience gains. I mean, look how insane this actually is. The experience between the two teams is fairly similar, right? And the passive experience gain is 5,000. 5,000. The difference is the minion experience. Ooh, that arrow. That arrow. Woo! Beauty! What a beauty! Rumor has it that arrow travels across the world, collects Christmas present, and will be back in one and a half months to uh, give some surprises to the kids. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a nice arrow. But look at the minion experience. This is obviously also partly because they were cursed and so all of the lanes were pushing out against them and the, the blue red team lost out on some. But still, the gaps in XP here are just nasty. 
Talking about that, barbecue play. They want Diablo and they get Diablo, but there's the counter kill. Sonya is dead and they kill Falstead. Falstead is gone. Rega somehow made it out of the fight, God knows how, and then he still dies to Hanzo. Oh, and now that means that they have a four versus three going. There's no support for the cats, no sustain. So this keep in the middle is wide open. They don't want to waste too much time pushing into Chromie. It's kind of annoying. So instead, they're just going for the freebie at the bottom of the map. Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right. So with that, we now have still... Catap I mean, three catapults at the top. We're only 14 minutes in, but these things are starting to hurt. Boss is up in a minute. And, well, in addition to that, look at the experience. If they hit level 20 and they go for the boss again, yeah. You can do a whole lot with level 20 there. Storm Talons, of course, would be the big deal at this point. So, yeah. But then again, there's a couple of camps up to so get them first. There's another tribute coming up too. Each team now has one. Doesn't change the fact that the, ca the cats haven't taken down a single fort yet. That's the big problem. They are continuously faced with another catapult push uh, with one catapult push after another. Particularly their top lane will be in trouble throughout the entire game up to the point where they finally take the fort and maybe even the top lane keep out on the red team side. But currently it's tricky. So yeah. Either way, level 20 is coming in soon. And there's the fight. They don't have level 20 yet. Diablo barely saved. Barbecue and the save on Sylvanas. Diablo is dead again. Diablo is getting killed and killed and killed. Wailing arrow. Falstead is dead. Level 20 is there. This seems like it's the beginning of the end. Curse and boss is what they're going to get now. And nobody is there to stop them. Nobody can stop them. Yeah, that's a problem. That is a huge problem now. And I do not think that they can actually stop this. There's too much going on right now. You got the boss. Ah, I'm sorry, no curse. Sorry, it's, it's, it's the second tribute. I'm a man ahead of my time. I'm a man ahead of my time. I was already at tribute number three. No, but they still got the boss. So that alone with level 20 might already be it. So yeah, they're, they're, they're not quite cursing them yet. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, but that would have been, of course, the worst case scenario. Technically, you could go down, make a double boss play, go for the bottom key, playing super safe. But of course, they want to end the game here. Falset is going to be back in time to uh, get that gust out. They should also have level 20. But the whole idea here is to just get the boss to do the main amount of damage. Falstead is now back. And yeah, there is going to be a problem. Oh, double stun into Chromie. And Sylvanas is there, wants to kill, jumps out again. Yeah, this is going to get nasty. It's getting really nasty. Look how quickly the core is falling here. There's the gust, but the core is falling way too quickly. That boss has way too many hit points. That is the lead in the series. Absolutely, 100%. 14 kills to 3, and the Raiders are pulling ahead with a 1-0 in this winner bracket final. Best of 3. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two! Dragonshire is the map and the Raiders are crushing it today. I am amazed. I am repeating myself. I feel like a broken record, honestly, because I've been praising them over the moon ever since we started casting their games today. But honestly, they are playing great and they deserve it. So now we're heading into Dragonshire. They chose the map. They only need to win one more map in order to make it to the grand final. And yeah, well, the Cats, they got to step it up a bit if they want to have a chance to win the series and if they want to avoid dropping down into the loser's bracket. So let's see what we're getting. Obviously, the 10 heroes that have been played on the previous map cannot be played again. <laughs> and they're actually banning Chogal. Now, you have to keep in mind, by the way, that... So, first of all, the cats already played Chogal, okay? That's the first one, right? From the get-go. So, this is not a bullshit ban. Second of all, there's a lot of teams that really scrimmed and practiced for Meta Madness. And, therefore, also practiced a lot of these different compositions and different heroes so just as a little bit of a side note now Lucio gets banned but yeah I am very very eager to see what we're now gonna get from both teams 
There's a couple of curve balls that you can already throw if you really wanted to, but there's only 10 heroes that are now unavailable. For qualifier number one, we don't have pre-bans. If, go if we're going into qualifier two, three, four, five, and particularly the playoffs, there's going to be more and more pre-bans, which will make all of these games more interesting, particularly once we're, we're heading into game number three. But right now, it's only 10 heroes that are out. So you can still go for very, very normal drafts here. You don't have to go crazy. Hogger as a first ban pick. And we have Genji banned out as well. So meaning we're not gonna get the Shimada action again. Chromie has of course been playing. I mean, right now Chromie and Hanzo are already out. So you gotta look a little bit towards Nano and see what he's going to do now. What we're gonna get from him. We have still our double pick available for the red teams to start things off with. So what are our prior but they are prioritizing in the match? Anduin and Blaze. Light bomb engage as usual. We're not looking at the Korean meta where we're all of a sudden getting the bubble and we're going full full Donald. With a word. The word salvation. Nobody knows, but it starts with an S. And Anduin has small hands. Everybody says so. So yeah, no, no, and when no thingy there, this is still Europe, so this is still the West. We're gonna get the light bomb engage here. That's gonna be it. And Uberak and Greymane. So they're already starting to dive in a little bit. And if you're going for Greymane and Uberak, you might even see Li Ming here. So that's another option for them too. Try and just blow those targets to pieces. When you're talking support, maybe Malfurion to lock down whatever target you're being you're able to hit with, uh, with our with the beetle with the bug. So, yeah. Karazim. All right. My man in the house. Or band. Not in the house. Not today. Karazim would have been nice with this too because you have another hero that can just dive deep with the entire team. He dashes in, gets a 7th strike unleashed, and whoever is there is going to be uh, quickly healed up too. So, yeah. If you're going for a full-on dive composition, you can definitely do that. Hogger with Horder pulled, and all of a sudden you just, like, go full face onto a single target. Yeah, Melganus again. Melganus plays. Heavy frontline. And then Anwen to pull the targets out. Cassia for damage, okay. And yeah. Final two picks. What is Draco gonna get here? We need a bit more damage and we also still need a healer. Malfurion would be great with this. Deckard Kane maybe. I mean, again, it depends a little bit on how you're thinking about the draft, right? But, like, if you're trying to lock the target down and you want to follow up with a potential stun. Stukov. Stukov is also still out there. And there he is. Stukov and Li Ming. Okay. That is looking clean cut. Very solid. I like it. This is a, this is a very clean draft. Clear plan behind it. Very standard. Very meta. This is solid. This can help them to turn this around. You take control of the game, you get these Anubarak Stuk of Engages, Grey Man Liming follow up with damage, get your kills and go for it. And then we have Gia on the other side with the final pick. And it is Carrigan! Nice! Carrigan, Blaze and Malganas. Alright guys, so the Raiders are aiming for the 2-0. Let's find out together on Dragonshy if they can pull it off as we're heading into the second game of the best of three. Game number two. Is it the final map in this winner bracket? Final, yes or no? The blue team certainly has other plans. They went for Herath with Hogger. Dark Reader, aka Drak here, is playing Li Ming. We got Captain Rex on Stukov, Unforgiven on Greymane, and Nagrom on Nubarak. To the right side of the map, the Raiders with Sven on Blaze, Johan on Aganis, Hunter Organ Anduin, Nan on Cassia, and more importantly, we have Gia on Kerrigan. All right. Also, big discussion that just started in Twitch chat, and uh, people on YouTube can also maybe chip in a little bit. So we talked. Uh, ooh, let me hold on a second here. Yeah, we talked about cities and cities to live in because people sometimes, for some reason, still think that I live in Berlin. And I actually lived in Berlin for a year. It was a long, long time ago. And Nuburak is living into in the nether uh, world, though, so he's dead. <laughs> that was a quick first blood. And this is exactly what I was worried about when I saw that Carrigan pick. Uh, this is gonna potentially get wild. 
But yeah, so Berlin is a city, honestly, that I think is really nice for visiting. But personally, I would not want to live there once again. I lived there a year and that was more than enough. I really didn't like it. And I think it's not a nice city to live in by any means. Most people that I've ever heard of talking about what a nice city it is to live in, not just to visit, are actually people that have never visited anything else or lived anywhere else, which always amuses the hell out of me. But it sparked a bit of a discussion of which bigger cities in the world are actually nice to live in. And I have to say that my years that I spent in Seoul were fantastic. I loved Seoul. I really thought it was amazing. I lived in Australia for a while and I liked both Sydney and Melbourne. I can always argue what is a big city, at what point does that start. Valencia in Spain is amazing, but if you measure it to other huge cities in the world, then it's of course rather tiny, even though it's one of the big three cities in Spain itself. But particularly when we're talking about the US, I haven't really been to New York, but I have friends that live there right now, and I think I would really love to visit that. I haven't really been to the East Coast as much as I would uh, want to. But LA in particular is something that I just found absolutely disgusting as well. I mean, LA was not nice. The Walk of Fame was probably one of the most disappointing experiences that I ever had in my life. I couldn't believe, like, I, I was there without realizing that I was there. And at some point I look on the ground and it's like dirty everywhere. It's just like people are yelling into microphones about how you burn in hell and Jesus and what other, other shit they could come up with. And I look on the ground and I see these stars on the ground and I'm like, wait a second, is this it? Is this really it? I couldn't believe it. So it's kind of mind-blowing to me. LA is definitely one of the cities that I think is just no, no thank you. And when it comes to big cities, I mean, I guess in Asia there's quite a few that are probably nice. I've been to a few cities in China too, but nah. It's a bit of a weird topic. On the one hand, you want to live in a city because it offers you a lot on the cultural side and restaurants and uh, clubs and whatnot. But I think if you, for example, Valencia offers all of that to me fairly easily. And I love the city and also the, uh, the weather and the climate here. But when I talk about big cities, I think Seoul is probably the one that I can compare to the most. Um, at the time when I was living there, Seoul had, I believe, 9 million inhabitants. And it was a very, very convenient and nice city. So I really loved that. But it's an interesting discussion to have. And I guess, obviously, people will always disagree in what they prefer there. But for me personally, when we're talking Berlin, when we're talking about LA and some others, there's a definite no from me. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, either way. In our game here, we have with Carrigan the biggest threat right now. So our girl up at the top, Gia, if somebody rocks that skin, you already know that they definitely are out for blood. Backfires a little bit here, not too much. Plays eat some damage, but it's nothing too insane yet. But of course, they are going to... Oh my god, Li Ming really got soloed there? Nano just soloed Li Ming. I saw them on the minimap and was watching the hit point pool there for a second. I was thinking, all right. Shouldn't really be anything uh, that goes wrong there. And then all of a sudden, she's dead. So he literally soloed her, uh, soloed her which was kind of bonkers. We got two kills, 2-0 two now. The Raiders again popping off in the early stages. How far they can go with this, that's another question. Don't forget, they picked the map. So they wanted to play here. This is a map where it's very important that you are getting a lot of control particular around the objective <laughs> for man for Cassia they're like all right boys let's go uh, nearly got that Anduin runs in sees company and immediately decides that this is not his day but with gray main on structures together with not only Liming but also a camp this is awesome and they're gonna get a Dragonite okay now we're talking the cats ladies and gentlemen they got one kill they get massive damage down at the bottom of the map destroy the entire wall and they lock in a Dragonite and all they had to do was kill one hero one kill and they got a wall destroyed and they lock in an objective nice pretty neat very very well done the early level 7 comes through as their reward and of course, right now, oh, hello, Greymane. I don't think they can get the kill, but damn, they're chasing them hard. Sukov is dead, isn't he? I think she's gonna get the, the cooldown back. No, not quite. Oh, ha, ha, ha. That is some dangerous place, I gotta admit. Oh, the jet propulsion, and now Liming is dead after all. Okay, so it seems like the Raiders weren't really too fond of not only losing a hero, but also the objective. So they're very quickly starting to turn it around again with another kill. But they have taken damage. They have taken a lot. They've lost two walls. They lost a lot of the hit points in the middle. And up at the top, as you can see, this is just going to get in continued. So, yeah, that's pretty huge. 
I mean, at the same time, we have now three kills to one, but both teams on level eight. So no advantages, like too crazy here. Nagrom is also getting attacked down at the bottom of the map now for just a second, so he has to be really careful. The Beetle is great for engage plays and moving in to try and drop an opponent with a bit of help and a follow-up. But if you become the target, then uh, Nubarak is not the most hit point heavy tank in the pool. So yeah, there's that. Down to the bottom of the map though, we still have the Bermuda Triangle right here where heroes tend to disappear being fairly dangerous as both teams are attempting to set up some small ganks. And of course everybody is also looking towards experience and a potential level 10 that would help them to get to heroic abilities first and use that to pressure and get more kills. So that's the next thing. Carrigan gets crushed in the middle. So yeah, Anubarak and Greymane, they get the kill. Carry can Carrigan carry again? That's the question. And so far the answer is a maybe. Got a few good moves, but also got shut down there. And that leads to an early level 10. And of course, with that, we get a fort destroyed. Had to play it safe. You can't get too close to an Uberak once that your opponent has a rogue, so you're going to get cocooned quickly and forced into a fight you don't want to take. But now we have Carrigan with the Ultralisk. We get also Light Bomb. Blaze can buy some time with the bunker. No, he can't, because maybe now? Yep! There it is, and they kill an Uberak. And Nubarak is down, and thanks to the Ultralist, they also get good old Stukov. And well, in the meantime, we have them with a 5 versus 3. Down here, Melganis goes up against Li Ming, and nearly gets a kill. And now they're going to get a Dragonite, I suppose. Well, at least they can try to make a play, but the Nubarak is back, so as long as Greymin buys a bit of time, that should be more than enough. I mean, maybe they can zo zone him out slightly. No, they're actually getting it. They get it. Dragonite is in. Top lane. They try to go for Hogger. Spin to win, baby. Spin, spin, spin. No, not in that direction. <laughs> yeah, goodbye. There's a lock and that's... Do not tell me he gets out. No. Anduin dies and Hogger makes it out. You gotta be kidding me. That's insane. That is crazy. Good on the cats. Play survived earlier, barely made it out, and now it's instead Hawker that gets away, but Carrigan is there once again, and they at least go for Greyman. So they aren't able to take Hogger down, so they settle for Greyman instead, and also they destroy the fort in the middle. And Nubarak gets his butt kicked again, and Hogger needs to be also careful that he doesn't stay too long, because yes, he's gonna get some additional company very quickly. Middle of the map, ooh, Cassia. Yeah, there's the stun, and well, Malganis is also saying hello, so all of a sudden we have the Cocoon out, Light Bomb nicely avoided by Stukov with a quick slap there. That was clutch, if he doesn't slap and the Light Bomb explodes in his face, then it might just be the end of him. So, six kills to three, still a half level lead for the Raiders, each team has now destroyed a fort, both of them in the middle. Very, very cool game. So, yeah, very cool game once again with the blue team clearly being in a much better spot than they were in game number one. Not there yet, but yeah, they are doing better and better right now. Doing the best that they can. Always attempting, of course, to get that one play going where they can take a kill and then go for another structure. And with the Nubarak also, they can dive on structure, spawn a couple of beetles and allow for the rest of the team to do damage, which they're trying at the bot lane now. Hogger not here yet. Forced into a fight, maybe. Yeah, Carrigan is there. Waits a little bit with a combo. And the Valkyrie is also missing, so they all get out of the fight before it can get too bad. Now, the big trump card for the blue team for the cats is obviously also that they have Liming, right? You go into a team fight, you hold it back, poke a little bit, and you get a couple of resets with a nice Calamity, for example, and that can snowball a fight super quickly. So it can really turn uh, the tables on the opponent's team. But still, currently a bit of an edge for uh, the Raiders. Yeah, they got Greymane there, so they can wait this out slightly. He doesn't even commit. Plays at the top against Hogger. So still that one versus one. And Anubarak isn't here yet. They're really hoping to lock someone down now. Yeah, but they can't quite. And thanks to the camp that Hogger had to assist him, he also holds the lane for now. 
But down at the bottom of the map, that's where the real the real fight now starts. They're trying again for Stukov, and they turn it. They turn it quickly, and they go for Nuburak, and they take him down. But it's a counter kill. There's that reset that we talked about a second ago. Chrysalis to try and deny the follow-up kill, but Kerrigan is dead. And Nano cannot get the counter kill on Liming. He was so close, but he can't make it happen. Jet Propulsion misses. Hogger is at the top, could go for the fort, and is trying to do exactly that. Whereas down here, the desperate attempt to make sure that they're not losing the Dragonite. Hogger could actually have gone for it. But instead, he's trying to guarantee them a fort. So he's making a play for that. Down at the bottom of the map, the battle still continues. 16 isn't there yet for either team, so it means that we also don't have the double pull for... And win, and that could be the end of Cassia, but she gets out. So Cassia gets out, they still have double control, they can send someone in the middle, and I think they're about to do that with Nuburak and Hogger, both of them are moving in, and I don't think the interrupt will be there in time, and yes, it's not happening. We might go to game number three. The way that the blue team is playing is so much better than what we saw in game number one. Might even get a kill down at the bottom of the map. Calamity with some damage, but not enough. Nice dodge though, but you can't dodge them all. Cannot dodge them all. There's the kill right there. Eight kills to five. Hogger in the middle. Two forts have been destroyed. The cats, they pull ahead. They definitely do. Yes, they lose a hero or two there, but they still are ahead in structures and that's at the end of the day what matters the most so eight kills to five but still looking pretty darn good for the cats considering that they're now about to destroy the final fort on the map of the raiders so they're coming in and they're starting to take this one out basically what the raiders need is they really need a big team fight where they can uh, get carry again and also blaze synced up get those cc chains going and take some of these heroes out. Once, the, If they can keep the kill pace up, I mean, again, it's gonna flip in their favor, probably, simply because they're in a spot where those death timers are increasing as the game goes on, and yeah, we'll see what they can do there. But right now, we got eight kills, two, five. Uh, down here, party also continues as everybody is committing to the battle. Combos not quite landing the way that they want to, and they are starting to retreat again. But with the forts destroyed and only the keep still up on the map, that's something that you definitely have to think about. All right, Malganis. So far, so good. They go for a new Barak, and he dives out. Jet Propulsion doesn't connect with him. Hoga is still on the mound. He's still fine. Can come in from the side with another good shockwave. Tries to line him up. Gets one, gets two. And Nano gets near, gets destroyed. Gets destroyed in the second attempt. Well done. Great play. Good coordination on the kill. And they can't turn it, can they? They're trying, but the light bomb goes nowhere. Just forces them back. Now Anduin is gone. And they nearly got Morganus too. Seven kills to eight. The cats, ladies and gentlemen. Fighting tooth and claw to get this back to uh, game number three and they're looking good they're looking really good now because at this point you have gray main to just shred structures whenever you get onto them there's 15 seconds until cassia is back they nearly get blaze killed back there with stukov but then anubura gets caught and killed so kerrigan is still keeping them uh, in uh, in the game in the run for the key, but it might still be destroyed, even with Cassia now respawning. There's too many catapults, oh, well, there's one catapult, and there's also the Siege Giants. So it's Malganus that goes deep, nice, sets up the stun, sets up the stun! There it is, the kill against Hogger, but they still lost the key, hashtag worth it. Depending on how much more they're losing here. They're losing Stukov again, he sacrifices himself. Walks away from the rest of the team so that they can't chase him down one after another. That's 11 kills to 4. Still the leading experience, but the problem still remains. They just lost their bottom keep. Their opponent, the opponent still has a fort there. They need the Dragonite and they need to do damage. The bot lane has to be their focus. They need to destroy this fort. Somebody has to go into the middle and ensure that they're going to get that Dragonite. Greymane hasn't moved back yet. Yeah, it's not made a move there, and they go in the middle with Nano, he's the one to claim it, and now they have to destroy some of these. Top side, big chunk of experience, of course, that can be claimed there, so Johan puts the team into, well, nearly into range of level 20. Yeah, once that they start with the cap at the bottom of the map now, and also the fort there, once they start taking all of this, they will grab Storm Talons, 
that changes the balance very quickly considering that the cats still need an entire level to get to the next talent yeah that's a that's a big gap that's a huge gap you can do a lot with this you might be able to get a keep with this even and that would negate the entire advantage that the cats have been fighting for so as is we now get burn notice seeker swarm sensor titan's revenge and the psionic shift and they're still not letting up on this and why would they they're, they're not letting up on this they're going full on for the aggression here and they're trying to get this done get this keep destroyed they have no hit points left on the dragonite anymore though so poke is all that they can hope for uh, also the gap has pretty much been closed so if you want to play this safe you see if maybe somebody steps out a bit, dangle, <laughs> dangle a carrot in front of their face while a Kerrigan is waiting at the side. But they're not doing anything that reckless. The level 20, we get Tarashas, Hunter's Blunderbuss, and the Traitor King. Yeah, still an advantage for the blue team. Both teams are now level 20, we will have even talents until the end of the game. But the cats still have a chance there. They are still ahead. Slightly, but they're still there. So, yeah. Not too bad. Not too shabby. So. What else can we get now? We have four now. I mean, up at the top side. Still Blaze pushing the camp out. And once he does, they can put this onto the fort. They need, I mean, they need to go for a fight. A double pull on Anduin alone is already worth a lot. There's the stun. This could be the end of Nubarat. Nice. Nicely done. Good plays from Stuko. Pushing them back. Buying them a little bit of time and space. Carrigan cocooned in the back line. Careful. Hogar can't go too deep here. Is still playing this out with the Ultralisk, actually. And now they're focusing instead of Greymane. And he's dead. Greymane dead. Stuko dead. Uh oh. Uh-oh, that's a problem, and a big one at that, you just lost two, your bot lane is open, and shrines are coming up in 27 seconds. If they are able to go now for the bottom keep, take it down, and on the way back grab the Dragonite, that would be a bit of a disaster. And while this is happening, this is happening too, this top lane fort might actually fall to the push. So, the blue team might lose their entire advantage here in one fell swoop, thanks to the double kill that the Raiders just locked in. So, there's the chance, right there. The keep is gone. What are they going to do from here? They go core. They go core. They have 30 seconds and they go core. Screw their Dragonite. Let's go core, baby. They have to make sure that Li Ming is not able to get resets. They turn in on Anubarak and Anub is about to get wrecked. They are... Can they take him down? They're all so low. Hogger spinning out of control. Li Ming, reset number one, reset number two. She pops them like pimples. And Numera gets killed. Li Ming goes for another one. And they just, ha they just fucked up. They just fucked up big time. They're losing the entire team. Five man team. Wipe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be game. They cross the map, they end the game. No way you're getting the heroes back in time. Nicely done. They catch with the defense. I told you from the beginning, they gotta make sure that Li Ming doesn't get the resets, and they just didn't. It didn't happen. They got Greyman. No, yeah, don't. they got Greyman here. Okay, so they should be able to end the game. Without Greyman, maybe there's a chance that they buy enough time, but yeah, with him, that's just not happening. So, yeah, unfortunately for the Raiders, we kind of threw this a little bit. Great for the Cats, though. We're going game three, everybody. Full distance in the winner bracket final as the Cats take the core down on Dragonshire and claim victory. GG. Battlefield of Eternity, Game 3. I don't think that the Raiders are really too happy about it, considering how the last game ended. Let's face it, Li Ming was the one thing that they had to be careful about, and they were just crushed by a reset after reset, calamity after calamity. And if they played it a bit safe, I think they could have won that. But now we are in Game 3, and I honestly don't mind it. It means that 20 heroes are unavailable. The 20 heroes that were already played cannot be played again. <laughs> we get Jogal banned again so the Raiders they don't like fun and they know that for the cats this is not just a meme pick that they would really love to play Jogal here 
always depends on what exactly you are getting rid there so yeah but again we have the quick ban on sergeant hammer as well so let's have a look how they are going to draft this out this time Medivh gets banned they're continuing to really target some of these off picks that could be potentially played by the cats so they basically just try to avoid any kind of like um of, of any kind of curveball right so anything that could be a little bit on the weird side where they don't know exactly how to respond to it or not that confident and they're trying to just shut that down so choga gets banned Medivh gets banned both of them really enable a lot of these plays on the other side you're getting these siege up sergeant hammer combos denied and johanna which is another one of those heroes that johan really loves to play leads us to the first pick for the raiders Kinda curious what Nano's gonna play. Tracer is, by the way, still up as a potential pick. Vala is up for this map. Just thinking about it for a moment. Vala is up. And gets instantly picked. So, yeah. Vala gets taken, and that immediately begs the question, are we gonna see a single, or are we gonna see a double support? Is it gonna be some Uther main tank second support to keep Vala alive and see her with auto attacks, or are we gonna get instead an arrow build? We've seen both already on Battlefield in this tournament. Can make a good argument for both. If you're just thinking about chunking down the Immortal as quickly as you possibly can, Arrow Bill is the way to go. If you're looking at team fights and you're just trying to dominate the battle by taking your opponent down, then an auto attack style with Vala and decent support behind her can be better. So, yeah. But again, we have Chen taken by Hirath and Captain Rex and Lucio. Chen is kind of funny to me because he was played by Max Passion a lot on the European side to an extent where people banned Chen against teams that Max Passion was on. Now we've seen Chen also played by Kabibara a lot in uh, the context of the latest Korea tournament. And I think that we're going to see him a little bit more right now. Chen can actually be fairly amazing if you play him properly. Uh, so yeah, Fat Illidan, always kind of fun. Here comes Uther and we get Arthurs. So I suppose technically they can still take another support, put on, on uh, put Usa into a main tank position, and Arthur's onto the side lane, so that still works. We'll see if they do it. But this is a little bit of the... Nah, it's not quite the same draft. It has a few of the elements that we've seen previously when the Saboteurs, the team around Dino and Hazo, uh, are playing. Benny with Arthur's was fun, and I really like that we're seeing Arthur's again here, so that's kind of cool. But, yeah. I, I like it. The, the, the draft for game number three is already interesting. We got Chen, we got Arthurs, Vala is in here, which I always think is fun. They ban out Muradins, so they're trying to force them a bit away from the traditional frontline heroes that you would have. Them banning Muradin and picking Arthurs instead is actually really interesting to me too, con all things considered. So, yeah. And with the next double pick, what is the blue team uh, gonna get for us now? I want that range damage, Sheila. Like, oh, where's the damage coming from? Give me something. Chen is already cool. Yes, we get Suljin. Suljin and ETC. Look at this. Chen, Suljin, ETC. They're going for the full zoo over here. Okay. That is gonna be that is gonna be a cool one. With Suljin in particular. Let's go. I'm actually. It's kind of weird, honestly, if you think about it, that we haven't seen more Suljin in uh, this tournament so far. It's the first qualifier, obviously, but I would expect that we're going to get to see a little bit more Suljin as we're going into the second, third one, and so on. Sven with Samoro. There's the second support, by the way, so they're actually going for it. I mean, look at this combo. They have Uther as a main tank. They got Malfurion. Now, Vala's the only range damage dealer. Samoro's job is to piss the opponent off, and then you have Arthur's on top of that. I like it! I like it. That's pretty cool. And Dark Reader, what are we gonna get from him? Mephisto. Alright guys, cool draft. I like it. This is awesome. Let's go. Battlefield of Eternity, everybody. The final game in the winner bracket final here in the first qualifier for Meta Madness. Prepare yourself. Well, I am prepared. I am prepared for game number three. On the left, Captain Rex with Lucio. We got Nagrom on ETC. Moo. 
Hirath is playing Chen. We got Unforgiven on Suljin. He's got Axe. And we got Drakia on Mephisto. On the right side of the map, it is the Raiders with Sven on Samoro. Hunterhawk on Malfuria. Nano on Uther. Nano on Uther with Johanna playing Arthurs. And yes, there is the auto attack build for Gia's Vala with the two supports that's obviously what you want to go for here so they're not focusing just blindly on burning the immortal down they want to win the team fights they want to try and take this on as quickly as they can that rotation towards the top by the way is already setting them up for a very strong early game they get a tower destroyed even Bala can stack a little bit and now the rotation is finally here and they're starting to attack things right away with Bala becoming the target but getting all of them heals and getting a couple of stacks together. So she's sitting at 15. That was a highly successful early game. One tower down, Bala has some stacks, they didn't lose anybody and now it is Arthas that rotates towards the top to beat the rest of the team. He's been soaking an extra wave down at the bottom of the map and they now have Samoro here who is even able to do more damage to those structures. Great early game. I mean, look at this. They're even getting a lockdown here and that's going to be a kill. Yeah, that is kill number one. And it's also stack, 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 stack for Vala as they're locking in a second one. What the hell? They're going for a three. It's a triple baby. <laughs> it's a triple baby. Damn, the Raiders. Holy hell. It's, it, they're nuts. Guys, 38 stacks currently for Vala. They just got three kills. They have a level lead and they already destroyed one tower. They're going for the second now. Bot lane pressure from Samoro. They are crushing this. Absolutely crushing this. Level one, by the way, the bone slicer right there. I mean, if he gets stacked, if Suljin gets stacked properly and is stacking his level seven too, there are some options for them to really dominate the late game. Problem is always, you gotta get to the late game first because, before you can dominate it. And right now, I am not so sure if they are actually able to pull that one off. Because that early game was rough. One level lead around level four. Yeah, you are in for some trouble. And maybe, can they get a lockdown? Yeah, they can, but there's no real follow-up on this. So, Mala is still stacking, first quest reward is already there, and Nakrom, Nakrom is just getting crushed. ETC is down for the second time, I knew that the, and they're killing, oh, what the hell? They're killing, they're killing Suljin too. I knew that Nakrom, uh, that Gia was hungry, but that he was that starving for beef, I had no idea. They're killing ETC for the second time in a row, and just look up, five kills to zero. Five kills to zero. That's where we're at right now. Immortal is coming up next. They can try and take this one too. Imagine if they win the Immortal and push with the level 7 talent before the opponent has it. Because this is what we're essentially talking about here. Gia is already stacking the Hatred up. They're trying to defend here, essentially. They won't be able to win the halftime show anymore. That one's already out. EDC is, of course, great, booping people into immortal stuns. But this is a huge victory on the halftime for the red team. All of this happening still without level 7 talents. But they are now trying to just continue from here on out. So, yeah, this is getting real nasty. Good damage against Lucio. He's low, he's low, he's low, he's dead. Yeah, he, he has a problem, and that's a, the problem is called running out of hit points and running out of them quickly. We found the issue. It's a severe lack of HP, and Jen has the same one. It's contagious. It's contagious, guys. Can't get vaccinated against that. So that's seven kills to zero, and Vala locks it in for the team. They're going to get, and she even keeps the camp in play. Keeps the camp active, and they're going to get this one too, aren't they? Should get a few more heroes involved to make sure that they're getting it in time to rotate back down, but that also guarantees them level 7, and all of a sudden it's a talent advantage. It's a one level advantage, and they can get all of this done with the bottom of the map too. So they're a bit late to the party here because of that, but boy is that rough. And they're actually letting this push alone because they realize that they can now simply go to the top and uh, dish out the damage there. It should be a fort. They should be able to take the fort. Sometimes, I mean, yes. Vala at 69 stacks, nice. And here's the fort that is pretty much guaranteed to be destroyed. 
And Malas, of course, is continuing uh, turning everybody on the blue team side into a pincushion. Because it is 8 kills to 0. Voila is crushing it. They're getting 2 forts out of it. 2. They kill both. They take both forts down. They probably lose Arthas as a result. But hell, it's worth it. No, they don't even lose him. This is, this is insane. The Raiders today are just crazy. I can also at the same time also implore all of you that have children in the room right now that you please get them out of the room. I will not be responsible for any psychological damage that is done to the young and vulnerable that have to watch this right now. This is not legal in many states in the US. I can't speak for Germany, but I know that also in Europe this is a little bit on the edgy side. So guys, please, if you have kids in the room, women and children first, evacuate them because this is hard to watch. I understand this is tough, but yeah, I am not going to be responsible for any psychological damage that is done and any lasting damages. So yeah, level 10 any moment that put your sunglasses on to shield yourself a bit against the glare that is the brilliance that are the raiders <laughs> however because yeah, this is this is just bonkers <laughs> oh my god illusion masters in it's a one and a half level lead as the second objective comes online ah, it's a guaranteed objective by the way vicious assault at level seven so not even stacking here Suljin has pretty much just said, all right, and we need to go for a different build. Bala goes in, gets another kill with Malfurion. And they're like, ooh, a camp. They wanted to steal the camp, and they nearly did it. They were so damn close to steal that camp, I really thought they had it. I, I thought they had it already. But yeah, now it's nine kills, two, one. And of course, that means that Uza has to pay the next keg of beer. Because he's the only one that has fallen so far. It's either that or getting a five-man report. And yes, he would report himself here. Totally deserved. But with half a level missing until level 10, it's of course just a question of are they going to crush this right away? Uh, is there going to be a fight? Without level 10, the blue team can't battle this one out. So yeah, there's level 10. Quick pick is in. This is maybe they have a chance here, but boy, it is a slim one. ETC trying to party it out. That didn't happen. Vala a bit in trouble, gets the heal, gets the heal, gets the Divine Shield. They're trying to turn it. Suljin with the ult. There's Dingo, and he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Vala gets another stack. She's at 100 now. ETC with another slide, a slide to... Oh, Vala actually down. They actually got Vala. Good. Chen, my man. Fat Illidim comes in and takes Vala down. That was big dies in the process but hey that's one of the gambit stacks removed and also makes this push a little bit easier to deal with so yeah good for them immortal with nearly a full shield so it's going to break through the wall for sure without vala though the question is how much damage can they do and they're actually not doing anything they're just letting this one sit so chen saves the day chen's just really saved the day for them if he doesn't kill vala there this is a keep nicely done good stuff so, with that, we now have, down at the bottom of the map, still a bit of experience that gets locked in by the Raiders, so it gets them close to the level 13, another talent advantage. Also getting the camps up at the top, so there's that. And here we are. That's what has damage, by the way. 21,000, girl, you gotta step it up a little bit. What is this shit? I'm not signing up for this crap. We need a bit more damage. I mean, come on. You're better than this, Vala. Money pig and all. Up, 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 up. Don't you dare face checking a bush and dying here again. You need to you need to go a little bit ham. Getting out damaged by Mephisto. That's not how we do things here. Vala is love. Vala is life. Let's go. Ah, but good on Mephisto. Good on Drak here. So he's able to do some work with this. Good for my man. And down to the bottom of the map. Okay, so they go for the next camp here. They can pretty much take everything. Samuro, by the way, is so damn annoying. Samuro is just going to be annoying throughout this entire game now. He has so much space to work with already, thanks to the two forts that got destroyed. We're only 10 minutes in. So there's a good chance that he's just going to knock down some of these structures as the game continues. 
Now I'm still having my eye on Suljin a bit. He at least was able to get to the 15 stacks, which means that he has now the range increase on his auto attacks. That makes it a bit easier for him to pad his baseline quest. But since he doesn't have any additional stacking on level 7, it doesn't really matter too much right now. But having, of course, some solid auto attack damage as the game progresses would be a win. And they're very close to level 13, so they are catching up a little bit. It's the structures that are really the biggest problem for them. Losing two forts is an issue. It means that you don't have a fountain nearby outside of the one in the middle. And uh, also slows your entire game down a bit. So again, it's more of a defensive play that we have. They don't have 13 yet, so that window is just so... It's just out of reach. Really annoying. So they gotta defend. And while they're defending, Samuro is still making his own place there, pushing to the top with the camp that they took. And eventually somebody will have to go back for that. So Chen is coming in, trying to isolate a target, and he can't. He just can't. They're going for Arthur's. Well, that stun into the Immortal Stun, it forced the Divine Shield out, but they're turning it quickly. Might be able to force Suljin's ult too, and before that even happens, Chen's the one to fall. Uh, ETC. So ETC is already gone. They go for the halftime show again. They even want another kill. And the keep at the top is exposed since the wall has been destroyed. So now they have level 13, but it doesn't really do anything for you if your opponent is already two levels ahead of you. You're fighting a four versus five. And they're getting closer and closer to level 16. So they could destroy some of the hit points here. But yeah, not a whole lot more that you can do there. Look at that shield again. 21,000 HP on that shield. That's big. That is huge. And that is gonna hurt. Likely they're gonna go for a keep right now. So, yep, this is gonna get nasty. Samura is already at the top. There's two keeps exposed now, so that's where they make their play. And they're also trying to use Samura to get to level 16, which they are about to grab. So now they have a talent advantage again. Vala has Manticore. That in and of itself is already bad enough. Benediction is another big problem. And Embrace Death continues the build from uh, Arthur's. And the, the keep at the top is going to fall to Samura. They're just trying to win the fight at the bottom of the map. Push Nano out of the Mosh Pit. He didn't have Divine Shield, does have it now, didn't need it. Now ETC is dead. This is a 5 versus 4. This is a 5 versus 4 at the bottom of the map, and they're going to lose everything now. They're losing the keep at the top. They, it's gone. Keep is gone. Catapult takes it out, and now they're going to lose the one at the bottom of the map as well. It's disastrous what's happening here for the Raiders. The Raiders, they lose ground, they lose everything now. 14 kills to 2. Can they go game? Do they even want to? Do they even want to risk it after what happened on the last map? But considering that they're now taking Suljin down, why wouldn't they, right? That's the play to make right there. Everybody's dead, but they lose Malfury, and the core is falling quickly, though. So if they can right-click it here, then by all means go for it. And particularly Samuro is doing just way too much damage. He's already having it down to 40%. And that is it. The Raiders, ladies and gentlemen. They get to the Grand Final. They take down the Cats with a 2-1 victory. And they enter the Grand Final. They send the Cats packing and send them down into the loser's bracket. GG.